with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. What if someone came up to you and asked you, what does Jesus look like? Take a moment, think about how you picture Jesus and how would you answer? What does Jesus look like? A swarthy bearded man wearing a robe and sandals perhaps? Good looking, could God be anything else? Definitely nice eyes, kind, gentle, loving, and a twinkle in them indicating a good sense of humor. Jesus was probably calm, comforting, and had a peaceful presence, like in those pastoral pictures when he's carrying sheep or surrounded by children. Well, today we get to throw that image right out the window. Because today we get a picture of what Jesus looks like. A Jesus who is angry, sweaty, throwing a tantrum, turning over tables, and brandishing a homemade whip. This public disorderly conduct is not the typical Christ-like model of serenity, is it? I mean, is this the picture of Jesus that you would share if someone would ask you? Probably not. But it's a familiar story, depicted in almost every Jesus film ever made. Jesus is so angry. And what sets him off? Walking into the courts of the temple and observing the commerce. Sheep, cattle, doves, money changers taking the Roman coins with the image of Caesar and exchanging them with the image less temple coins. Jesus' anger is directed at those money changers and the sellers of sacrificial livestock when he cries, 
Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Now, John is the only gospel writer who puts this story in the context of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The other three synoptic gospels put it towards the end of the story. And why does this matter? Because John is giving us a picture of what Jesus looks like. John paints the picture of who Jesus is, giving us signs throughout his whole gospel. And John, at the beginning, wants us to know right away. So in one sentence in the temple, Jesus claims his identity. Note, he didn't say, stop making the Lord's house a marketplace. He says, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Jesus, the son of the Holy One God. So right from the beginning, we have a picture of who Jesus is. And then he makes another claim. He says, I want to get it right. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Imagine if someone would stand on the portico of Trinity here and say, Destroy this building, and in three days, I'll build it again. Actually, it'd be really nice if the organ builder would say that, but I don't think that's happening. But rebuild a massive structure in three days? Ridiculous, right? But in hindsight, John reflects that the disciples remembered this story and Jesus' words after his resurrection so they were able to finally figure it out what Jesus meant. Remember that this temple wasn't just another building for worship and sacrifice to God. It wasn't one of many. After the conquering of the southern kingdom of Israel and the Babylonian exile and the return, this temple had to be rebuilt. And it was under construction at least 46 years. But the temple was the place in Israel where God resided. The Holy of Holies, God's personal living room. And this is why so many pilgrims made the journey to Jerusalem to go to the temple and sacrifice there. So if this temple were to be destroyed, where would God live? The readers of John heard the answer because the temple that Jesus was talking about was not a building of mortar and stone. The temple was then replaced by the body of Jesus. When I was a kid, I grew up learning that our church was God's house. I wasn't allowed to run or skip or be loud in the sanctuary. I had to be very reverent in God's house. But then I thought, as I got older, God has a lot of houses. There are cathedrals and storefronts, nowadays chapels and IMAX theaters, Lutheran, Catholic, Methodist, and Pentecostal houses, and all around the world. And I wondered as a kid, how does God get to live in all those houses? After the resurrection and the ascension, the understanding of the presence of God changed. God didn't need a temple to be present with the people. In Jesus Christ, God came to live among us. And as Christians, God continues to live with us and through us. You know the image. We are the body of Christ. And the church of every time and every place is indeed the body of Christ. That's amazing. So what does this mean for us and our lives now? Because our lives paint a picture of Jesus for others. I'm constantly amazed at the conflict that has been caused by the Ten Commandments. There have been lawsuits and protests regarding the public posting of these words from the Hebrew scriptures. And in the midst of Lent, hearing the scripture can be a little jarring. 
We're already working on being penitent. We have that long confession. We're trying to repent from our sinful ways, and here in the Old Testament lesson, we get another verbal warning, reminding us of all the laws God has given and what we've broken and how we've strayed from God's ways. Listening to that Exodus text, it can either beat us down further, bring on another burdening guilt trip for all our sin, or it could be a great excuse for self-righteousness because we can point our figures at the other people that we know who have flagrantly broken these commandments. But when we do it that way, we look at the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, through the me, myself, and I lens. Because if we consider God's law as something that I alone either make or break, if we think the commandments are the measurement of our own personal good and my own good Christian living is the assurance that I'm right with God and have a ticket to heaven, then we've missed the boat completely. We teach our confirmation students that the Ten Commandments are all about relationship, our relationship with God and our relationship with our neighbor. The first three, or four, depending on your tradition, deals with how we are in relationship with God and who God is. And the remaining commandments talk about the community. And sometimes I wish that these commandments were written differently. Because imagine if instead of hearing, you shall have no other gods before me, you hear, you have abundant life together with me. Or instead of hearing, you shall not steal, we hear, you get to appreciate and care for what you have and share appropriately with others. It'd be nice to have the commandments explained like that, and guess what? They are. Because if you would turn to page 1160 in your red hymnal, you don't have to do it now, but you can look at it sometime, there we have the small catechism of Martin Luther. Martin Luther took the time to look at these commandments and to explain them so that we can take these home and read about it and teach it to our families. So for example, we hear, thou shalt not steal. What does this mean? Or what is this? We are to fear and love God so that we neither take our neighbor's money or property nor acquire them by using shoddy merchandise or crooked deals, but instead help them to improve and protect their property and income. So for all the thou shalt nots, we get a lot of thou shalls, the things we get to do, and the way it brings life to all. During our Wednesday Lenten worship services, we're reminded that Jesus taught the greatest commandment of them all is the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Kinds of sums up the Ten Commandments in two short phrases. And we try. But even if we try our hardest to live by these laws, we screw up. And when we mess up, the fabric of our relationship with God and with one another is torn apart. But hear this, through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus does not come at us with a homemade cord of whips raging against us. Through the gospel, we know when we have sinned, we are not condemned, but forgiven. And God opens God's arms so wide in forgiveness, so wide that Jesus gave his life for us on the cross. That's not a very pretty picture either, is it? What Jesus looks like. But it is an enduring image 
an image of sacrificial love and forgiveness. Gracious, gracious forgiveness. And a little later, we will hear the, wor the words, this is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you. At this table, God gives us a great big hug. And God tells us that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you have done, God says, I love you and I forgive you. Come. And when we take and when we eat, Jesus becomes a part of us too. We know God is no longer confined to a building and the image of Christ is etched on each of our faces. So after church today, go and look in a mirror. And if someone asks you, what does Jesus look like? Remember, you are the hands and face. And Jesus goes out with us and in us and through us. And that is a picture worth sharing. Amen. Marked with the cross of Christ Jesus, let us boldly profess our baptismal faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. to you for help, O oh God, praying for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. Please kneel or be seated.
for the body of Christ that we might trust in the foolishness of God, for houses of worship everywhere, that your sanctuaries may be holy, devoted above all to you and your mission. We pray for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, and for Father John, and for the Christ St. Luke's Partnership Parish and their pastors, Bruce and Rebecca, and for the congregation and staff of Grace Lutheran Church in Reading. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For wisdom to steward carefully all your creation, for animals of every kind, for veterinarians and zookeepers, for biologists and ranchers, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations of the world and their leaders, that peace and freedom will replace tyranny in every place. For legislatures and judges, for merchants and entrepreneurs, for police and military personnel, for the civilians of war-torn lands, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those captive to addictions, for victims of crime, for survivors of sexual or domestic abuse, for those sick with malaria, HIV, AIDS, or cancer, for those with Alzheimer's and their caregivers, that your presence and promises may strengthen them and give them hope. We pray this day for all in any need, especially for Brian Trupp, Ed Draper, Tom Schultz, Barry Reichert, Rendell Wolf, Dave McKenney, Joan Goncher, Jan Rita Clemison, Nan Podiger, Bill Davidson, Martha Tobias, Marie Swigert, Pastor Eckhard Grimm, and Cindy Shirek, and those others we now name. Marco, Heidi, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this faith community, whenever we make idols, misuse your name, break the Sabbath, dishonor our parents, murder, commit adultery, bear false witness, and covet what is not our own, that you bring us to repentance and renewal. Be with our vestry as it meets tomorrow, and bring your blessing upon your sisters and brothers whom we remember this week. Stephen, Helen, Maya, Yanni, and Leon Nigerian, Robin, Amy, Sam and Olivia Nelson, Brad, Shannon, Luca, Stella, Reed, and Lloyd Newmoyer, Ruth Norton, Bill, Charlie, and Katie Norton. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up loved ones who have died in the faith especially praying for Chris Fisher and his family at the death of his mother, trusting that in the crucified and risen Christ, we are bound to them in death as in life. Lord, in your mercy, hear Now is the acceptable time to offer our prayers to you, God of grace and truth. Receive them in your mercy and grant us all that we need in Jesus' name. <laughs> 